So disclaimer, um, when it comes to daily mass, I don't have an approach of just, you know, preaching to the choir, just kind of hunting until the weekend. I feel, well, this is an opportunity. We've come to be fed by the word and sacrament. So if there's a meaningful message, let it rip. Uh, with that, also keep in mind that I wish I had the whole church here right now. So just sometimes you're like, man, is Father Kevin talking to me? Like, well, yes, but I'm talking to everyone. So it's not just limited to the Daily Mass crowd. And then thirdly, uh, when there's a topic that I may be passionate about, I might raise my voice, like today. Uh, I think that might happen. But one image I gave someone is when I was talking passionately about something where there was um, evidence to me that the person had been, let's say, under the influence of kind of foolish rationale, foolish thinking. Um, to use a, a scene from C.S. Lewis in The Great Divorce, there's this lizard on this one man's shoulder who keeps on kind of lying to him. And so if I sound forceful, <clears throat> it's not directed at you. If I sound forceful or passionate, it's because I'm talking to that lizard on the shoulder of the world that's also in the church. And if we who claim to be wise remain silent and just expect, well, you'll figure it out on your own when you read the scriptures and read the catechism, while the world is shouting its lies, we tend to kind of remember the last thing we heard. Okay, so that's all the disclaimer. Wisdom. Authentic religion is the pursuit of wisdom. What if I told you that there were um, a, a group of siblings that decided to make some rules for the house that they didn't have to do chores anymore, like take out the trash? How do you think mom and dad would receive that? Do you think that would go very well? Think that would work out in the end? How do you think the house would feel? Do you think the kids would enjoy if no one took out the trash anymore? Hmm. What do you think if Adam and Eve had passed a law that said we should be able to eat the fruit of any tree in the garden without consequences? And they signed it, and they dated it, and they enacted it in paradise. Do you think that would have prevented the fall? You think that would have prevented death entering our humanity, human existence? But Lord, we, we made up new rules. Didn't you make us to be autonomous and to be thinking for ourselves? Well, not at the expense of ignoring God's rules. And God made a pretty clear rule. You can eat of all of these trees, but of this tree you are not to eat, and if you do, you will die. So regardless of what Adam and Eve enact as their own rules, or what they believe will or won't happen, they are subject to the consequences according to God's worldview. The way to foolishness is foolishness. The way to wisdom is wisdom. The road to heaven is heaven. The road to hell is hell. The way we take steps on that road is simply making decisions by what we do or fail to do that take us one step further on that road. But even before the steps on the way to foolishness or wisdom is the rationale or the logic of wisdom and foolishness. I don't have a direct insight into the quantity of souls or the specific names of souls in heaven or hell except what the church has declared among the canonized saints. But I think that it's pretty consistent and pretty reliable to consider there are many people in hell who are wise in the way of the world, but foolish 
in the ways of God. And I think it's safe to believe, even among the canonized saints, there are many souls in heaven who were foolish in the world's eyes, but were wise in what mattered to God. So the reading we just heard from Wisdom, chapter 1, verse 1, is not directed to the average person, but to leaders and judges. Love justice, you who judge the earth. You who judge what is true and false. You who pass laws. Love justice. Think of the Lord in goodness and seek him in integrity of heart, otherwise stated sincerity of heart. Because he is found by those who test him not, and he manifests himself to those who do not disbelieve him. For, this is important, for perverse counsels separate a man from God, and his power put to the proof rebukes the foolhardy. So I don't normally quote individual um, Catholic politicians, but when it's pretty clear that they're saying something in the public forum that is a direct quote that I think is foolish, I think it'd be important for us to at least take it as a case study to examine it for its foolishness so that we are not misled by those who judge wrongly. In recent weeks, Nancy Pelosi brought a bill to the floor and it subsequently passed in the House, the Women's Health Protection Act, legislation that would override state abortion laws and allow for abortions in some cases throughout all nine months of pregnancy. Pelosi declared earlier this month in September that she would bring it up to a vote and her local bishop, her local ordinary, Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion of San Francisco, said that the bill is nothing short of child sacrifice. I don't know about you, but if my bishop warns me, pretty sternly rebukes me, as we heard Jesus telling us to rebuke the person in error, why? Because we don't want anyone to be self-deceived and lead themselves to hell. Be on your guard. If a brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he doesn't repent, keep on rebuking him until he repents. When asked about Cordelione's comment at her Thursday press briefing, Pelosi responded that it's none of our business how other people choose the size and timing of their families. Hmm. Where can I go from your spirit? From your presence, where can I flee? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I sink to the netherworld, you are present there. I don't know, God's wisdom, God's word, seems to indicate that the whole world is his and that his wisdom is to have dominion over all places and all peoples. And we, as disciples of Jesus, are to lead others from error to truth, from foolishness to wisdom. Pelosi continued, the archbishop of the city of that area of San Francisco and I had a disagreement about who should decide this family size and timing. Now it's interesting, just, I think it's noteworthy, the archbishop of the city of that area, not the local representative of the church militant and the person that I trust was appointed within the Lord's providence to shepherd me rightly. Not just kind of coincidentally, yeah, that, that guy. We have overlapping jurisdictions. 
She continues, I believe that God has given us a free will to honor our responsibilities. God gave us free will. That is a true statement. I have no problem with that. I fully endorse that statement. God did give us a free will, and we are to use it to choose the good, to choose the right, to choose wisdom, to reject error and sin and deceit. The logic of that foolishness is is grossly incomplete, grossly negligent, and scandalous to apply that logic to perpetuate the Holocaust of unborn children. Nancy, you're right. God gave us a free will, and some choices are always wrong. They are always foolish. And we sin, egregiously even, when we exercise our free will in certain ways. We may also uh, confront the core logic of our gospel today from Luke 17. Well, if your brother wrongs you seven times in one day and returns to you seven times saying, I'm sorry, you should forgive him. If a person hears that and walks away going, hey, hey guys, I got the inside track on this. All you have to do is say, I'm sorry, and God will forgive you. Is that what it said? You just say words and magically you're free from consequences? No, that's not what it said. If the person repents and sincerely recognizes their error, seeks to offer just restitution, and intends not to return to their sin, then yes, forgive them seven times. If our brother sins and does not repent, rebuke him. We were given a free will, but our free will is to choose the good, to choose justice, to choose what serves life. We do not have the ability to create our own rules of our own making and be as foolish as we can be without consequences. We are free to make any choice we make, but we are not free of the consequences of our choice. And there are grave consequences for choosing foolishness and even greater consequences for leading others into that blindness and error. The sin of scandal is a great weight at one's judgment by what one did and said or failed to do and failed to say. I want to conclude with one question. Do you think that God should welcome everyone to heaven that sincerely wants to go to heaven? I do. I hope their choices reflect their desire to go to heaven. But let me, let me ask you this. Would it be fair if you are in heaven and the Lord starts allowing people in that don't really like the light thing, they kind of, you know, want some shadows? They don't really like the whole, there's a whole law of love and you have to obey that law. Like they don't like the fact that you've already made your eternal choice and they still want free will to choose other things in heaven. Would you want that person in heaven with you? I wouldn't. Kind of defeats the purpose of heaven. Heaven is a place of perfection, of love and perfect communion with God and neighbor. That's what makes it heaven. It's not about a place. It's about a mode of relationship. I guarantee you, that Nancy Pelosi wants that version of heaven. A place of perfect harmony 
and I'm going to leave her out of the equation. But if a person were to be asked by the Lord, who's living foolishness, and they said, well, do you want a heaven like this of total perfection, where everyone is living love and truth? I'd say yes. And by your own words, you condemn yourself. Because the way to heaven is heaven. And the way to hell is hell. And you can't live the logic of foolishness and error and sin and hell. And just wake up in heaven. We must choose wisdom now. Because God is the witness of his inmost self and the sure observer of his heart and the listener to his tongue. For the Spirit of the Lord fills the world, is all-embracing, and knows what man says. Please stand. Confident in our belief of the communion of saints, let us pray for all who have passed through death, especially those who need the charity of our intercessions. That members of the church on earth may never forget the church waiting for final glory in eternity, let us pray to the Lord. That light and peace will be given to the souls of those who never knew Christ in this life, Let us pray to the Lord. That people who fear death will find hope in the risen Christ and his cleansing forgiveness. Let us pray to the Lord. That those among us who mourn a recent loss will be consoled as they pray for the ones they love. Let us pray to the Lord. That the mercy revealed in purgatory will deepen our trust in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. For all the intentions we bring to this day's Mass, for the sick and for the dying, and especially the primary intention of this Mass, for the conversion of our nation, its leaders, its citizens, and all residents, let us pray to the Lord. That our Masses and prayers will help the souls of of our departed relatives and friends for Rosemary Purvis, for Kate Warner, and for all recorded in the Book of the Dead. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of life, into your care we commend the souls of those who wait to share in the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. 